My Work is Not Yet Done by Thomas Ligotti Part 1 1. I had always been afraid. However, as self-serving as this may sound, I never believed this to be a cause for shame or regret, even though an intolerable suffering may ensue from such a trait. It seemed to me that the finest people, as people go, cannot help but betray a fair portion of fear and insecurity, even full-blown panic. On the other hand, someone must have a considerable dose of the swine in their makeup to get through even a single day unafflicted by trepidations of one sort or another, not to mention those who go out of their way to court dangerous encounters, fearlessly calling attention to themselves, figuratively waving their arms and declaring to everyone within range, Hey, look at me. I'm up here. See what I can do. I'm the one you have to knock down. I'm the one. Of course, there is a measure of beast's blood in anyone who aspires to maintain a place in the world. Anyone who lacks that ultimate decency to remove themselves from the herd, either by violence to themselves or total capitulation to their dread. It's simply a matter of degree. At the company where I had been a long-time employee, the purest breed of swine was represented by the seven persons with whom I met in a conference room according to a weekly schedule. I had risen, somewhat reluctantly but with a definite touch of swinishness, to the position of a supervisor in my division of a company in which there were countless other divisions. This made it necessary to attend these meetings along with six others of my kind and a seventh who was our superior by virtue of his having outswined the rest of us. During a meeting of my own staff, someone whose mind was not fixated, as was mine, on the swine analogy, referred to these persons with whom I met, according to a weekly schedule, as the seven dwarfs. So what does that make me, Dave? Snow White? No, Frank, interjected Lisa. That would make you Prince, uh, what's his name? Charming, said Lois. Pardon me, replied Lisa. Prince Charming, didn't you at least see the movie? This remark caused a hurt look to cross Lisa's face. It was a good one, very realistic. Hey, I was just kidding, said Lois, who wasn't easily taken in by false or exaggerated phenomena. Lisa perked up again on cue and continued, That's right, Prince Charming. Well, thanks for saying that, Lisa, I said, but I wasn't quick enough to head off Christine. We usually talk nice about Frank behind his back, but it's okay, you've only been here a week. I'm sorry if I sounded like I was trying to score points or something, said Lisa, actually sounding quite sincere this time. The department where I used to work. You're not there anymore, I said. You're here, and everyone here used to work somewhere else in the company. Except you, Frank, said Elias. You've been in this department forever. True enough, I replied. After the meeting with my staff ended, I proceeded immediately to the other meeting, where I intended to play the swine in a way I had never tried before. I had a new idea to present to my colleagues, which of course would involve a considerable amount of arm-waving and look-at-me behavior. It had been some time since I had re-accredited myself with my peers, and I was beginning to suffer from an uncomfortable sense that my standing with these persons was in question. This is the paradox of always being afraid. While the pangs of apprehension and self-consciousness may allow you to imagine yourself as being created of finer materials than most, a certain level of such agony necessarily drives you to grovel for the reassurances and approval of swine, or dwarfs if you like, who function as conductors of a fear from which they themselves do not appear to suffer. And how well they're able to control this fear turning it in your direction at will and causing its dreadful current to flow just long enough to send you running to them so that you may be allowed to make a case for your own swinehood, hoping to prove that you are an even bigger swine or a smaller dwarf than they. This is the only thing that can bring some relief from that most pernicious form of being afraid, 
the anxiety provoked by other people and what they may do to you, either collectively or as individual agents. Tragically, the same fear that allows you to believe yourself a better specimen of the human species than those around you can only be tolerated for so long. Anything beyond that point, any excess of anxiety, and you begin to imagine yourself closeted in a little room somewhere under heavy sedation or to consider an act of slaughter against yourself or perhaps against others. Thus I was aching with hopes for my new idea my special plan to increase the prosperity of the company, that institutional manifestation of the swine. I longed for it to receive the snuffling high sign of my fellow wallowers in filth, the low-voiced sanction, or so I hoped, of the seven other dwarfs. Needless to say, I was terror-stricken. 2. As usual, I was the first to arrive in the conference room where I met with the six other supervisors in the division and with Richard, our manager. This room was located outside the modernized office space wherein most of the company carried out its activities and was a place that still exhibited, unharmed by refurbishing, the pre-depression style of the building in which the company occupied several floors. I was never sure what purpose the room was originally intended to serve, but it was disproportionately large and lofty for the small talk of business that echoed within its realm. Furthermore, it was quite dimly lighted by the rows of ornately sconced fixtures that jutted out at intervals from the faded and intricate wallpaper which had peeled away in spots. One could barely see the crumbled moldings interposed between the upper edges of the walls and the shadowy ceiling. The table at which I and the others met seemed to have been imported from the banquet hall of an earlier century, while the enormous leather chairs in which our bodies truly appeared of dwarfish size had become brittle over the years and creaked like old floorboards whenever we shifted within them. There was a row of tall paned windows along one of the walls, each of them still valanced but without curtains. I liked to look out of these windows because they offered a view of the river as well as a fine panorama of several other old office buildings. However, on that particular morning, a heavy spring fog had lingered long enough to obstruct any view of the river and had turned the other buildings in the downtown area into specters of themselves, only the nearest of which could be seen to cast their illumination through the fog like strange lighthouses. And I was grateful to the aging monuments of the city for providing me, by no means for the first time, with a calming perspective that only a vision of degeneration and decline can bestow. Soon enough, though, the others arrived and took their places, setting down upon the already scarred finish of the table their outsized mugs of coffee or towering containers of bottled water. I never failed to wonder how they were able to consume such incredible quantities of coffee, water, fruit juice, and what have you during these meetings which always went on for at least an hour. I myself made a point of not taking in unaccustomed amounts of liquid prior to these weekly convocations, just so that I might avoid the necessity of disrupting the proceedings by bursting out of the room in search of the nearest lavatory. But none of the others appeared to have the least problem in this area, however closely I scrutinized them for telltale signs of stress. Least of all did Richard seem bothered by such bodily strain, since he always showed up with not only the largest container of coffee, but also a huge thermos from which he would at least twice refill his great barrel of a cup on which was emblazoned the company logo. Just watching them gulp mouthful after mouthful of their various liquids sometimes brought fantasies of a gleaming row of urinals to my mind. Perhaps they all wore special undergarments, I once considered, and freely relieved themselves as we spoke about budgets and headcounts, speed to market and outsourcing. All of which is simply to say that my co-functionaries within the division, along with Richard, were a complete mystery to me on every level. They seemed to me as fantastic beings who well deserved the fairy tale designation of the Seven Dwarfs, 
even though there was a more mundane and obvious reason for calling them such. This reason, I should point out, did not derive from any shared qualities between dopey, grumpy, sleepy, and the rest of that cute and hard-working crew, and the seven persons, not including myself, now seated at that nicely decrepit table. My fellow supervisors, plus Richard, were neither conspicuously cute, with one exception, nor hard-working. But their names were, no kidding, Barry, Harry, Perry, Mary, Carrie, Sherry, and, of course, Richard, whom I had heard referred to as the Doctor, although the origin of this nickname, which was a matter of both credible anecdote and curious imaginings, in no way linked him with the dwarfish Doc of the fairy tale. Richard finally cleared his throat with a forced rattling sound that was his way of bringing the meeting to order. Everyone stopped chatting and turned toward the head of the table, where sat the only one of us whose chair didn't appear too big for his body. But Richard's stature was more than that of someone who purchased his suits at clothes stores catering to large-bodied men. His physical conformation, straight and solid from head to toe, was imposingly athletic, the anatomy of an erstwhile ball player of some kind who had kept his shape into middle age. In all probability, Richard had garnered his share of shining trophies for the glory of self and school. He wouldn't be the first member of middle to upper level corporate management with a background in the world of sport, with all the playing field metaphors they borrowed from that milieu chief among them being all that puke-inducing nonsense about teams. The characterization of someone as a team player was at the top of my lineup of emetic expressions of this sort. All right, then, let's get started, barked Richard as he stared down at a page on the table that listed the agenda items for that week's meeting. Looks like you're up first, Domino. Something to do with new product. For the record, my last name is not Domino, it's Dominio, with two eyes. For the record, I had attempted to correct Richard both publicly and privately regarding the accurate form of my surname. For the record, I could never be absolutely sure that it wasn't pure indifference rather than a taste for malicious mockery that accounted for his persistently calling me Domino although this sly mangling of my name never failed to draw a few muted snickers from the others, and Richard could not have been oblivious to that. Like a dealer at a poker game, I quickly passed around to my colleagues the two-page proposal I had distilled from a much longer document. This handout was composed with wide margins and a large font for speedy absorption into the systems of busy middle management types. I tried not to look around the table as they all glanced it over, turning from page one to page two almost simultaneously. When Richard was finished, he laid the document on the table before him and gazed upon it as if he were looking at a bowl of cereal in which he thought he might have spotted something unsavory, or possibly peering into a riverbed in which he glimpsed a shiny nugget in the shallows of clear water. Forgive me, Frank said Richard, but I'm not sure I understand what this is supposed to be. I sat up as high as I could in my giant's chair. At the last meeting, you said that New Product was putting out one of the rare calls for suggestions for, well, new product ideas. This is a proposal for a new product, possibly an entire line of new product. That much I comprehend, thank you. It's just... Um, this is a little far afield from what I think anyone had in mind. I realize how it might seem that way. This is why I thought I would bring it up initially at this meeting. I'd consider whatever feedback anyone might have to be of value before I submitted my proposal in full. There's more to this? asked Richard. Quite a bit, yes, I said. Hmm, that's really something. I can only wonder where you found the time, given that the rest of us have been frantically trying to dig our way out of one landslide or another that's threatening to bury us around here. I did almost all of it on my own time, if that's your concern, I said. My only concern, 
replied Richard as he slowly looked around the table at the other supervisors. My primary concern, I should say, is that the new product idea you're proposing doesn't look like the sort of thing we do around here. I mean, I'm all for being risky and innovative and all that, but this is... Oh, boy. But we could do it, I argued. We have the people, the know-how, all the processes in place already. True enough, admitted Richard. But I don't know. Does anyone else have any thoughts about this? It is different, said Perry. Definitely different, said Harry. I'm not sure we do in fact have the staff needed to take on something like this, said Mary. I've got fewer people taking on more projects all the time, said Kerry. Systematically, Barry began, instantly losing the attention of his auditors. At one juncture in his jargon-polluted soliloquy of a business analyst, he used the words data vamping, which I believe was a neologism of his own devising. Ultimately, of course, he sided with Richard, concluding that my idea, which Barry explained had built into it at least two, perhaps two and a half, facets, was not leverage-focused, nor was it customerly, in Barry's opinion. Sherry was at a characteristic loss to add anything to the litany of negation already recited by the others, although she did manage to come up with faster, better, cheaper, which on this occasion might be construed to mean that my proposal was not quite in line with this triple-headed ideal. By this point I was writhing within the creaking depths of my chair shaking my head in a slight palsy of horror and forming phrases in my mind that refused to come together into coherent sentences. Then, for a brief moment, the words congealed. I know that the company has traditionally produced only that which looks like what it has previously produced. In other words, recycled impersonations of what we've been doing for the past two decades. It's called leveraging, Frank. It's what we do, and it's still managing a good margin. But for how much longer? Look, said Richard, I enjoy brainstorming new ideas as much as the next guy. It's just that, by bringing this to me, to all of us, it's like asking for a sanction of some kind. And that's asking a lot. How about if you hold off on this a while? Give us all some time to think this over and revisit the whole thing at a later date. What do you say? Sure, I said, positive that this matter would never arise again. Fine, said Richard. Now let's move on to the next item on the agenda. And for the rest of the meeting I tried not to betray my inner turmoil. Moreover, I couldn't keep my mind from its obsession with a new terror the sense that I had been the victim of an ambush, that no scheme that I might have advanced before that particular gathering stood a chance, that whatever plan I had brought to that meeting and laid upon that time-ravaged table would have died there. Outside the windows of that antiquated room the fog was slowly fading away, revealing once again a view of the river and a cityscape in which my mind moved among scenes of calming decay. 3. Fear, when blended with failure, distills into a deadly brew. I had been so caught up in what I thought was the brilliance of my new idea, my special plan, that I never seriously pondered the consequences of it being rejected out of hand by the very persons I most wanted to accept it. This was a miscalculation of vast proportions, no question about it. For the rest of that morning, as I sat in my supervisor's cubicle, I could do nothing but inwardly reproach myself for being a creature of deranged judgment, and not even that. I was no more than a primitive organism with no faculty of judgment whatever, a slick of slime mold posing as a human being. You're making too much of this, said one of those secondary cells that are implanted inside every one of us and that come to attention on these occasions, spitting forth idiotic cliches like a mad schoolmaster from a worn-out textbook of conventional wisdom. In the grand scheme of things, the voice continued before I grabbed it with both hands and wrung its neck, spitting out my words of contempt through gritted teeth. A. There is no grand scheme of things. B. 
if there were a grand scheme of things, the fact, the fact, that we are not equipped to perceive it, either by natural or supernatural means, is a nightmarish obscenity. C. The very notion of a grand scheme of things is a nightmarish obscenity. When Galileo brought his findings before the board of directors at Vatican Incorporated, he was at least armed with facts that reasonably supported his botched attempt to deal with those who endorsed the obscene notion of a grand scheme of things. He could know that he was right, even though he was also an utter fool for sharing what he knew with the wrong people. I couldn't know anything about the worth of my idea, my plan. Its value resided exclusively in the estimation of the people around me, especially Richard. It didn't matter, not even to me, whether or not it would prove to be a source of profit to the company, in the unlikely event that the greater powers of that commercial entity ever acted on my plans. Most initiatives did not amount to much. The important thing was to demonstrate that my four cloven feet were skittering swinishly in the same direction as those of everyone else. The debacle that took place at the meeting that foggy morning merely served to give away what I most wanted to hide, that I was moving in an entirely different direction from the rest of them. My only recourse now was to follow Galileo's example and recant my ridiculous idea, my special plan. Why my mind had brought forth such a scheme had begun to confound even me. I knew what I was supposed to say and do in my position at the company, and those duties did not involve any kind of innovation or brilliance whatever. From that moment I forswore such things as abominations and vowed never again to conceive a new thought or scheme or plan unless bidden to do so, a task I knew would never be inflicted on me. I would say and do only that which I was supposed to say and do. That was all. That and only that. But as my mind was still spinning in this groove of histrionic vows and disavowals, swearings and swearings off, the hulking shape of Richard appeared at the entrance to my cubicle. Got a minute? he asked. Sure, I said as he was already stepping into my workspace and making himself at home. In his fist was a copy of the two-page handout delineating the proposal I had proffered earlier that morning. Okay, here's how it is. Number one, I'm not saying that I'm going to make myself a signatory to any of this, or that I endorse it in any way, he said, lightly shaking at me the two-page handout he was holding. Number two, I don't want you to think that I'm a complete villain and that my function around here is to squash your spirit every chance I get. Therefore, I've decided to pass this along to new product. No special delivery, no marching bands or fanfare. Just push it into their mailbox and see what they make of it. Cut this down to a single page, a half page would be even better, and send it to me. I'll forward it to the NP crew along with some other communiques I have for them. Can you live with that? Yes, I can. Thanks very much. I sounded casual enough, or so I believed, but at that moment I could not help feeling a curative relief streaming through my system. I had been saved, and despite all the bitter recriminations that had echoed over and over only moments before in the darkness inside me, I had now become swollen with gratitude. Was this how Richard had acquired his rumored nickname? Thank you, Doc. Maybe we can even fit in your product idea for further discussion at next week's meeting, continued Richard. How's that sound? Sounds fine. All right, then, said Richard, turning to exit my cubicle. But he caught himself in mid-turn and doubled back. Ah, uh, Frank he said in what sounded to me like a lowered tone of voice. Yes? Along with the memo for new product, perhaps you should forward to me the rest of the work you've done on this, Richard said, once again rattling the two-page handout in the air. As I said at the meeting, I worked on this almost entirely at home, and that's where it is right now. Some of it's still in handwritten form. I'll clean it all up and send it to you as soon as I can, if that's okay. I hadn't missed a beat in my response to Richard's request, 
and yet for an unmeasurable splinter of a moment I saw him turn to stone before my eyes and fix a granite gaze upon me. Of course, he said. After Richard walked off, I waited until I thought it was safe, and then I collapsed my upper body across the counter of my cubicle. He knew, I thought. He knew I was lying to him. I had the entire proposal on a disc and printed out in a polished form as a stack of fifty-some pages in the lower drawer of my desk. I opened the drawer to check that its contents were actually still there. They were, even though for some delirious reason I thought they might not be. I touched the disc and flipped through the pages several times. They were still there. I closed the desk drawer. Then I opened it again and repeated my inspection a few more times before finally locking the drawer and placing the key inside my wallet. What I still could not understand was the reason for my deception. It had been committed as an act of pure instinct, without any rational basis. It couldn't have been that I was afraid that Richard was going to steal my proposal and arrange to take credit for it himself, I thought. Others had done that to me over the years, and I was never the least put out by their betrayal. I wasn't looking to move any higher in the company than my present position, so why should I care about making time with anyone but my immediate supervisor? I wanted to stay where I was, I wanted to keep my working life securely in the status quo, and I wanted to be left alone. This had been the motive for all my actions in my job. This was why employees of a similar disposition transferred to my department whenever there was an opening. We were a troop of contented parasites, self-made failures, and complacent losers. What lives we had were carried on entirely outside the psychic perimeter of the company. We did our jobs and did them as well as or better than anyone else in that organization. And then we went home and spent time with our families or worked in our gardens or painted pictures or simply did nothing at all. Whatever we sought to attain in this precarious and, in all candor, wretched world, we looked for outside the company. Of course, I could always send my full proposal the very next day, and Richard could then do with it what he wished. In that sense, I had done myself no special harm. But he would still know that I had lied to him, and I had no idea what that might mean. 4. Three days passed. On each of those days, immediately upon waking from my senseless or scary dreams, I said to myself, Today I'm going to send Richard the document of my plan. At the end of each day, having sent nothing to Richard, I said to myself, Tomorrow, without fail, I'm going to send Richard the document of my plan. So why was I stalling in this matter? Why was I setting out on a course that was clearly one of self-destruction, compounding my existing offense of having lied to Richard with that of blatant contempt for his instructions to send him the complete document of my plan? A provisional answer to this question came to me slowly over the course of those three days, and it had begun with that weekly meeting at which I felt myself to be the victim of ambush by all of them, not only Richard. His was simply the biggest and most hideous head of the monster. Six others also emanated from the body of the beast, circling on long, snaky necks about the expansive and twisted face at the center of the thing with its bloodshot eyes and killing breath. Richard did, in sooth, have a case of halitosis that could gag a maggot. Several incidents over this three-day period supported, however subtly, my seven-against-one theory. Each of these incidents was apparently isolated. Some of them, I would have to be quick to concede, were quite possibly without any nefarious intent or significance. I list them here in sequential order, with subheads to forecast the main players involved in these vignettes. So here we go, beginning with Perry. Later on Monday, the day of the weekly meeting, I was passing through the company's reception area. 
This was a plushly carpeted, softly lighted, and expensively decorated space that served both to impress and intimidate anyone who entered it, particularly first-time visitors such as new job applicants waiting to be summoned for an interview, business people waiting to be summoned by whomever was their contact within the company, or simply some kid delivering pizzas. Among the appointments of this area was a grand piano, which no one in the company ever touched, except Perry. It was not an unusual sight, especially around lunchtime, to see him either approaching, walking away from, hovering over, or actually playing that piano. Fortunately for all concerned, he never played for very long. What he did play was invariable. Perry's repertoire, judging by what I heard, consisted wholly of a series of jazzy-sounding chord changes that he would ham-fistedly pound out, following this racket with a tinkly right-hand flourish on the upper keys. This activity was but a single element of the jazz world image of himself that Perry appeared to hold and evidently desired to convey to others, although he did so in a haphazard or perhaps half-hearted manner. Overall, Perry was simply not a very jazzy individual, and he was intelligent and self-reflective enough to realize this fact. Nonetheless, from whatever mysterious motives, Perry was willing to settle for a Halloween costume version of Mr. Jazz that consisted of a few props, a stereotyped gesture or two, and a plastic mask. Aside from the piano playing and some talk about the latest CD of jazz music he had purchased, the most conspicuous aspect of Perry's jazzy persona was his eyeglasses, which were the precise type of thick-framed, heavily tinted jobs sported by cool jazz artists of the 1950s in photographs on the back covers of several prominent record albums of the period. Now, I myself wore eyeglasses contemporary in design, the lenses of which had a slight amber tint blended into them. Although I had opted for this feature on the advice of an optometrist, I never met an eye doctor or a dentist who wasn't a hustler at heart. Let's not even talk about physicians or, puh, those blood letters of the mind with a psychiatric shingle outside their door. The optometrist suggested that such tinting would better enable my defective sight to tolerate the fluorescent lights of the office, as well as the sort of illumination radiated by the screens of televisions and, boy, do I hate to even use the word, computers. There, I said it. As previously mentioned, I was merely passing through the company's reception area. My destination was elsewhere on that floor, where I needed to attend a meeting that concerned some routine function of my job. The piano was so positioned that Perry's jazz-oriented fumblings were being conducted with his back to me as I quietly passed by, so there was no call for me to shout out a hello or disturb the genius jazzer in any way. But just as I was about to move out of Perry's range, I saw that his head turned to look at me over his shoulder. Of course, I couldn't very well have halted in my tracks at that point and acknowledged that I had seen him look at me over his shoulder in what I thought to be a highly devious and menacing way, his eyes fully shaded by the soft lighting of the reception area reflecting off his heavily tinted glasses. At the same moment that he turned his head in my direction, Perry ended his musical performance not with a tinkling flourish on the upper keys of the piano, but with a dissonant cluster of notes made by a smash of his left hand on the lowest register of the keyboard. The cacophonous growl of these notes followed me as I made it around a corner and began walking down a long and brilliantly fluorescent hallway on my way to the meeting, which happened to include Mary. There she stood, some distance down the hallway, only a few feet from the open door of the meeting room, frozen for a second in a pose I had seen her assume before. 
I thought of it as her pre-entry pose, a posture she took on for a fraction of a second during which she seemed to stiffen even more than usual, as if to collect and consolidate herself both mentally and physically before entering a given public forum. Mary was in her fifties and availed herself, from her fluffy-haired head to her pointy high heels, of all the sartorial and cosmetic armor that was possible for one woman to bear. When viewed in her pre-entry pose, or really at any time when she was not speaking or jotting things in her scheduling book or engaged in some movement or other, she could easily be taken for a mannequin, even at the closest quarters. Without turning her head toward me, I didn't need that from a mannequin, she entered the meeting room and I followed close behind. In the course of this meeting, another regular weekly affair, this one focusing on schedules of production, Mary found the occasion to remark, Of course, Frank's department won't be able to meet this deadline, without qualifying this statement with the reason which he well knew for this fact. We're still in the process of testing the new software. I explained for the benefit of anyone at the meeting who might not have known why there was a temporary decline in the productivity of my department. The word software, as usual, stuck a bit in my throat and came out sounding a bit cracked. Of course, we understand, said Mary, while jotting away in her multi-ringed scheduling notebook, not giving the slightest glance my way as if I had just ineptly attempted to excuse myself and my staff on false grounds. So the damage, even if it was restricted entirely to atmospherics rather than facts, was done, and well done. No further encounters took place that day between myself and the Seven. Let's just call them that from now on and skip the dwarf part. As far as I'm concerned, fairy tales and legends, mythologies of all times and places, are just festering vestiges of a world that, for better or worse, is dead, dead, dead. Human life is not a quest or an odyssey or any of that romantic swill which is force-fed to us from our tenderest years to our dying day. All right, then, as Richard, like so many of his intrepid type, would say. The next run-in I had with one of the seven didn't occur until the following morning, Tuesday, when I looked up and saw standing at the entrance to my cubicle, Kerry. Do you have any postage stamps you could spare? She asked. I've got to get a credit card payment in the mail pronto. I was in the middle of conferring with Lois about the earlier mentioned software my staff was testing when Kerry anorexic and bird-beaked with a squarish Marine Corps haircut, interrupted us. Yeah, I think I've got some, I said. But what I thought was, why is Carrie borrowing postage stamps from me? She's the person to whom everyone in the division appeals when they've run out of stamps. The answer, which I heard with one ear as I rummaged through some desk drawers, was rambling out of Carrie's own mouth. Someone stole all mine, took a whole roll, not even opened, right out of my desk drawer. I'll have to start hiding the things. Everybody knows where I keep them. Here you go, I said as I turned in my chair and held out to her a crumpled packet with a few stamps left in it. At the same moment, I saw Carrie pick something up from my cubicle counter. Hey, what's this? she asked, or, more accurately, accused. What was this indeed, I thought, as I saw Carrie handling an unopened roll of stamps. Lois, who was seated in a chair between Carrie and myself, was trying to make herself discreetly invisible by fixing her eyes firmly upon some dimensionless point on the carpet. Carrie, I said, I have no idea where those came from. I just bet you don't, Frank, said Carrie before she turned and marched away. Lois, I said, did you see those stamps when you came in here? Lois materialized from her invisibility and replied, No, but I did not see them either. I mean, if someone should want to make a big deal about it, what could I say? 
Do you think I might have stolen Carrie's stamps? Not for a second, she shot back so fast that her words nearly overlapped my own. How could you even ask me that? Sorry, I said. Apology accepted, said Lois. But just because I know you didn't take Carrie's lousy stamps. Yeah, it looks bad, I said. Yes, it does, Lois agreed. That, of course, was exactly why Carrie made sure that Lois was present as a witness. This enabled Carrie to say, My stamps were missing, and I found them on Frank's desk. Go ahead, ask Lois. She was there. And what could Lois say but, Yes, I was there. I saw Carrie pick up a roll of stamps from Frank's desk. Of course, she could refuse to discuss the subject, but obviously that would only further incriminate me suggesting not only that Lois witnessed the event, but that she also considered it too sordid to speak of. Carrie had thus crafted a setup for which I had no possible defense in the court of rumor, even if nothing could be positively proved against me. In contrast to the bold tactics of Carrie were the effortless subversions of Harry. An affable enigma is the only way I can describe him. Always natally attired, a politely attentive aura hovering somewhere about his person whenever one spoke to him, always willing to get right on things anyone asked him to do, always willing to follow through with things whenever anyone made a request of him, and never ever doing any of these things. Consequently, I was not entirely unnerved when Harry returned to none of my phone messages, no one expected to speak to a living Harry when they dialed his extension. It was only when I took Harry's customary blackout on all transmissions coming from me and later added it to Richard's unusual and ominous inattention to my doings throughout the rest of that week, when normally he would have been looking over my shoulder at every opportunity, that I became concerned. But when it came to matters involving Harry, there was not much of which I could really be sure. What a master in the making he was, even if the truest candidate for better things, faster things, but in no sense cheaper things, was Barry. He was the most apparent of all the potential heirs to Richard's position when the day came that the one-time star quarterback or record-breaking baseball pitcher or whatever for one reason or another deported from our division, our company, or the world entirely. Seemingly, Barry was only passing through on a brief tour of duty as a departmental supervisor in the division. He came to us reputedly as a person who possessed highly evolved organizational skills, which he had demonstrated in a number of other hot spots throughout the company. When he arrived in our midst, he was already widely celebrated both behind his wide back and to his plump, fast-talking face, for his big brain and his freakish talent for sizing things up, for bringing law and order to the company's most unruly frontiers and outposts. My own sources inform me that the only reason that anyone with whom Barry worked endorsed his gifts so vigorously was to expedite his departure from their precincts, foisting him off on some unsuspecting department that could use some revving up and benefit from the rare potency of his well-endowed frontal lobe. And thus arose the legend of Barry the Brain, Barry the Organizer, and, most unfortunately, Barry the Reorganizer. Wherever he went in the wilderness of the company, he was given a free hand to revise the charts and maps, the processes and procedures that had always seemed to work so well, until he got his meaty hands on them. Because, in fact, as Barry moved with mighty strides from one position to another in the company, he left nothing but chaos, confusion, and conflict in the dust behind him. In my own observation, I could understand how he might be taken for a person of super-developed organizational skills, if only because he showed himself to be cruelly intolerant of the least lack of organization on the part of those around him, using his mile-a-minute mouth, his tireless zest for charts and graphs that no one else could comprehend due to their over-determined complexity, 
and his utterly bogus reputation to call into question the qualifications of anyone who questioned his. Yet there was a time when I actually empathized with this man, who obviously suffered from the same clinical disorder, obsessive-compulsive, with which I myself was plagued, although I struggled to hide my mania, which manifested itself in ways that could not help me in my career, rather than parading it for all to see. But the time for empathy had passed when I arrived at work earlier than usual on Wednesday of that week. I wasn't at all surprised that Barry was in the office at that early hour, although my inner alarm went off when I saw him marauding about the region of my cubicle, moving, as he always did, at a comically brisk pace for a man of his heftiness. Barry, I said by way of greeting. Frank, he returned his voice dopplering into the distance. Then, immediately upon entering my cubicle to begin my work that day, I jumped back as if a wild animal had leapt out at me. My own obsessiveness did not involve a fastidious sense of organization, but there was my workspace, and it was trim. I didn't think for a moment that the housekeeping staff of the building had gone on a rampage of tidiness where my cubicle was concerned. No others in the area betrayed such treatment, as I noted after a short and secretive investigation. Okay, so I got the message. Barry was here. It read as if spelled out in pushpins on my bulletin board. What of it, I thought. I had nothing to hide. Then my own variety of obsession took over, and I practically dove for the desk drawer which contained all the electronic and printed documentation of my proposal, my new product idea, my special plan. I was on my hands and knees staring at the dark metal face of the drawer. I wanted to dust it for fingerprints, using a magnifying glass to examine it for the tiniest signs of forced entry, test with a micrometer if the lock had been tampered with by foreign hands. Of course, none of that would have alleviated my anxiety, and in time, still on my hands and knees, I finally grasped the handle of the drawer and gave it a heart-stopping pull. It was still locked, for whatever that was worth and that was worth nothing, because someone could have picked the lock on the drawer, taken its contents, and closed it back up again. Pulling my wallet from my back pocket and fumbling around for the key, I then opened the drawer. Everything that had been inside before was still inside, yet I nonetheless wanted my print kit, magnifying glass, and micrometer to judge if anything had been disturbed. In addition to the documents locked away in that drawer was a folder of photographs of sites around the city, photographs which I had been taking for years. I had many more such folders at home, full of pictures of alleys and abandoned houses, boarded up churches, a derelict library with interior photos of fallen shelves and moldy books strewn across a gritty floor. Most precious to me was a series of photos I took of a place where there stood a crooked street sign, but no longer any street deserving of the name. Just some rubble along a path and a few relics of unidentifiable structures on either side of that path. To the naked eye, everything in my desk drawer seemed in order, but it was still possible that Barry had opened the drawer sometime before my arrival at work that morning photocopied the printed version of my document, electronically copied the electronic version of my document, and replaced it with a painstaking precision that only another obsessive could achieve. What are you doing down there? asked the voice of Barry the detective, Barry the spy. I slammed the drawer closed, too afraid to realize that I was giving myself away. I was taking something out of my pocket and a quarter popped out rolled under my desk. Something out of my pocket? That would not cut it with Barry. It had to be specific. But I did say a quarter, not just a coin. Did you want something for me? I asked. Yes, I did, replied Barry in a leisurely manner, uncharacteristically so. He then walked away, also in a leisurely manner. Barry the mover, Barry the shaker. Barry walked and talked in a leisurely manner.
I opened the drawer again and checked its contents, touching the lousy computer disk and rifling through the fifty-some pages of the printed document. Then I locked the drawer. Then I opened the drawer and repeated this ritual as needed throughout the day. I should have taken the goods and gone back home that morning. That would have to wait, though, until the workday's end, because, as bad luck would have it, I needed to finish up some small project and pass it on to Sherry. I stayed as close to my cubicle as I could during that day. I managed to forgo trips to the men's room and went without leaving the building for lunch at the Metro Diner, which was actually a daily pleasure, an escape rather, and not part of any ritualistic behavior. But at some point I needed to pass on this small, this eensy weensy project to Sherry. The deadline was two o'clock. I thought that perhaps I could get Sherry to pick up the work at my cubicle, rather than my having to transport it all the way across the floor to hers. However, she wasn't responding to my phone messages either, nor to the half-hourly messages I sent to her machine. When the time came to make the delivery, I tried to do it as fast as possible, striding at the speed of Barry to Sherry's cubicle which was near the door leading outside the company's office space and into the hallway, where one could still see the pre-depression style of the building and enjoy cracked walls and moldings, the dusty globes of dim light that depended from lengthy, tarnished chains running down from the high ceiling, and the creaky railings and banisters that lined the stairwell soaring both upward and downward into the most suggestive shadows I had ever seen. Arriving at Sherry's cubicle, however, I found that the handoff was not going to work as smoothly as I hoped. Sherry, I said. Could you wait a sec? She replied, very much preoccupied with digging something out of her purse. I realized that it was much more than she could handle, taking delivery of this knit-sized project and digging something out of her purse. She would have to finish the one before she could turn her mental resources to the other. That's all there was to it. I declared earlier in this document that, with one exception, there was no cuteness among the seven. Sherry was the exception, although a serious qualification must be appended to this statement. Physically she was attractive, not to the point of being a harrowing beauty, but enough to put her over the line between women of average or even good looks into the company of those who possess across-the-room attraction. If anyone believes that I'm perpetuating some arbitrary or twisted image of the world, that's fine with me. I wish them well in their transactions with social reality. The qualification to which I made reference above is this. If you happen to cross that room on the other side of which stood Sherry, what you confronted was, I can't even name it, some kind of thing inhabiting the body of an attractive woman, an alien from some diseased planet or a creature of low evolutionary stature that by some curious means had insinuated itself into a human being at some stage in her development, the result being this sherry thing. If she closed her eyes and didn't speak, Sherry could indeed pass for an attractive human female. But the moment she spoke, or the moment her thing-like eyes came into view, she became a gorgon, no mythic significance intended or necessary. This duality that Sherry embodied could often be a source of tremendous conflict to those around her who one moment would experience the tide pull of her figure, and the next moment, when she happened to speak or the image of her eyes loomed up, would be inwardly retching with disgust at the very existence of this sherry thing, as well as heaving away inside with self-revulsion for having felt an attraction to this creature. And at the moment I was standing at her desk, Sherry's eyes were turned away from me and I had already forgotten the sound of the few words she had spoken. So I stood and watched as she dug around for something in her purse, and the deeper she dug, the more she shifted about in her chair, causing her already short and close-fitting dress to rise higher and higher toward her buttocks. I was transfixed, turning to stone, 
until the door leading out into the hallway opened and someone entered the company's office space. This particular someone was Betty, one of the higher vice presidents in the company. I saw that it was Betty because, having emerged from my fixated staring at Sherry, I now noticed that palmed within her right hand was a small mirror in which she was watching Betty, watching me, watching her. Sherry then giggled and turned around. Hi, Betty, she said. Hello, Sherry, Betty said. But Betty had no hellos for Frank after she had seen me looking at Sherry in a way that I never wanted to be seen. Her face merely exhibited a look of disgust at me before she continued on her way. Now what have you got there, Frank? said Sherry. Without a word, I dropped the folder containing the project on her desk and, for the first time that day, made a visit to the men's room. 5. It was now Friday, and there had been no communication between myself and Richard since Monday. As a formality, I decided to check with someone in New Product to confirm whether or not Richard had delivered my truncated version of the two-page proposal that I had shown to the Seven on the first day of that week. No surprise. New Product had no record of such a proposal with my name attached to it. No surprise. They were no longer even soliciting ideas for New Product and rarely, if ever, did. No surprise. New Product was as much a mystery to me and its purpose and function as every other division in the company. Surprise. A freeze had been placed on all activities involving new product until the upcoming restructuring of the company had been set in motion and the company had relocated its whole operation, more than likely to some nice new high-rise in the suburbs, thereby fleeing the luxuriant rot of the city in which it had resided for over two decades. While the aforementioned changes within the company were news to me, and big news at that, None of it seemed to have the least force of reality behind it. This was more or less the case with all occasions of moment within that particular working world, and perhaps all others. So often there would be the promise of either some cataclysm or some bright new age on the horizon, but whatever it was, however it might seem to the imagination, it would unfailingly come and go like a thunderstorm through which one had slept leaving a few puddles and some small tree branches scattered upon the ground as the only evidence that anything at all had happened. Every milestone in the history of the company, even when forecast with heaps of hoopla, was ultimately played out according to some secret timeline of geologic tedium, so that it was drained of all interest and drama well before it took place and afterward went all but unnoticed. And the days rolled by, and one grew older, and none of it seemed to possess the least import or substance. Finally, looking back from the deathbed of your entire life in the working world, you would be left exclaiming, what was that all about? In this sense, the world of the company mirrored the world itself, which sometimes managed to stage a rousing first act and perhaps even provide a few engaging scenes of a second before devolving into a playwright's nightmare wherein the actors either butchered their lines or entirely forgot them, scenery collapsed, props misfired, and most of the audience left the theater during intermission. Nevertheless, the information that had leaked out to me from new product served as sufficient excuse to get together over lunch with a friend of mine within the company. Yes, I did have a friend or two in that place which I have thus far painted so darkly. I dialed his extension and actually reached a living person on the other end of the line. Hey, Frank, I said. Not only did we share the same given name, but both of us had also labored forever, as one of my staff put it, within our respective departments. Yeah, Frank. Got any lunch plans? Do I ever? Of course he didn't. Frank kept very much to himself as a rule. Somehow he had managed to remain on an even lower rung of the company ladder than I had over a comparably long career, I suppose you would call it. That alone earned him my deep respect. 
He also knew quite a lot about the company and its personnel that normally would have meant nothing to me. But that week had been anything but normal, and aside from what I had to tell Frank about the info I acquired from New Product that morning, there was something I wanted to ask him which served as my prime motivation for my requesting a lunchtime audience with my namesake. I had been waiting outside a few minutes before Frank emerged from the revolving doors of the old building, put on his sunglasses, and lit up a cigarette. The usual place? Frank asked. Unless there's somewhere else you'd prefer, I said. He just smiled, and we both started walking the mile or so to our destination, weaving through the regular cast of suits and street people. Frank looking down at the sidewalk as he smoked one cigarette after another while I alternated my gaze between the street level. Cheap clothes stores, cheap electronics stores, liquor lotto and checks cashed here stores, wig shops, pawn shops, gun shops, and the beau art skyline of the ever-receding past. The Metro Diner was located just beyond the fringes of the central downtown area of the city. When we walked in, I looked over toward the counter, behind which stood Lillian Hayes, the woman who owned and had operated the diner for the past thirty years or so. I caught her eye and smiled, and she gave a little wave my way. Then Frank and I settled into a booth toward the back. How's the sloppy burger these days? Frank asked. Still sloppy, still the best. That's for me, then he announced as he stubbed out his cigarette in a crusted ashtray that had a little metal band arching over it with grooves in which lighted cigarettes could be secured. You don't see these things much anymore, Frank observed, examining the ashtray with the eye of the most sensitive lover of downtrodden artifacts. There's something about it, you know? I know, I said. There's a Japanese word for it, wabi. Wabi repeated Frank, who didn't require a verbal definition of the word to understand its meaning. There was a lot about the Metro Diner that shared this same quality, which was the primary reason I had been an habitué of the place for many years. I also lived in the backstairs apartment above the diner, for which Lillian charged me a modest monthly rent. Over our sloppy burgers I told Frank about the restructuring of the company I had heard about, which elicited from him only a shrug of profound uninterest. Then I told him about the relocation, which interested him only from the practical standpoint of travel time to and from work. Is that it? Frank asked. Not quite, I said. What, somebody die? No, I said. You're leaving the company. Great. No, I'm not leaving the company, Frank. Then what? he asked. A question, I said, with a deliberate gravity that Frank just as deliberately ignored. Okay, shoot. Frank, why is Richard called the doctor? Frank smiled and pushed aside the plate on which only a few ketchup-soaked fries remained. Then he slowly, almost ritualistically, lit up a cigarette. This is going to cost you lunch, you know that, don't you? Done, I agreed. You really don't know about this? I mean, if you know that Richard's called the doctor in the first place, you should know the reason why. Well, I don't. I'm not even sure how I know what I know. I think I overheard it somewhere. Maybe it's a false memory, I don't know but my feeling is that this is not something I should be asking just anybody at the company. You're right about that, Frank said. You ask the wrong person what you just asked me and you might end up on your way out. Yeah, I understand that there have been people who were fired for one reason or another because of Richard. So he's a PhD in office politics, that much I know. Wrong. The title of doctor is ironic, Frank explained. Here's the reason. Richard has no fewer than three suicides to his credit. Two women, one guy. I can't believe you don't know this. You know me, Frank. I keep my head in the sand. It feels good down there. I know. Stay stupid, stay alive, Frank said. But that motto doesn't apply when it comes to Richard. 
I knew the family of the guy who did himself. He actually named Richard in his suicide note, but there was nothing that the family could do. Legally, I mean. He was a head case to begin with anyway. One of the women who killed herself didn't leave a note, but it wasn't hard to put cause and effect together. Rumor was she had had an affair with Richard. This was back when he was in whatever division he was in before he came to live with us. And the other woman? I asked. Frank paused to light another cigarette. This is the best one. It happened a couple months before you started at the company. This chick slit her wrists right in Richard's office, died spread out over his desk, blood running everywhere. Like a dead patient on an operating table. Right. It was that one that got him the name The Doctor. Before that little incident, the guy was in line to become CEO. He should have been running the company a long time ago. Who knows where he'd be now? Definitely not the manager of our hole-in-the-wall division. Even the other suicides wouldn't have made any difference. If anything, they only enhanced his resume as a real powerhouse exec. But the dead girl in the office, that didn't look too good. I think we'd better head back. I said, looking at my watch. On the way out, I waved goodbye to Lillian, and she waved back to me. Frank, I hope you didn't ask me about Richard because you're having some problem with him, said Frank as we retraced our route back to the building. At the time, I could neither confirm nor deny that this was the case. 6. There are some people who attest that they do not remember their dreams who have never known what it's like to awake screaming or half insane or merely trembling from the aftershock of a nightmare. These are not necessarily simple-minded persons or happy persons or persons of stunted imaginations, but somehow they have retained a lifelong innocence, never knowing the dread some feel upon approaching the bedroom and facing that descent into the darkness of unknown worlds that may range from cartoonish absurdity to quaking horror. They are very lucky people. I wish I were one of them. Over the weekend, I tried to put the office out of my mind like a bad dream. This task was made considerably more difficult by the new nightmares that began visiting me, ones in which a sleep world version of Richard took center stage. In these dreams I found myself back at the company, a place that resembled the dime store I used to visit when I was a kid. In the real dime store there was a corner that served as a miniature pet shop where living merchandise was on display. Several aquariums held a variety of small fish, and terrariums featured chameleons or tar-colored reptiles of some type that lay motionless against the glass. Parakeets twittered in bell-shaped cages, while guinea pigs and gerbils scampered about in square, smelly cages. I was walking slowly up and down the aisles in my dime store nightmares, fearful of drawing attention to myself. The reason I walked so slowly was that the floors were made of soft slats of wood which creaked with every step I took, and I didn't want to be seen by Richard, who was over in the corner with the caged animals. He was doing something terrible to them, although I couldn't specify what it was. But his fingers were able to reach between the closely spaced bars of the cages and could penetrate the glass of the fish tanks and the terrariums. I wanted to know what he was doing to these animals, but I was too afraid to look. And there were voices whispering to me about Richard. He's fixing them, the voices said, answering the unspoken question in my fearful mind. Why is he called the doctor? I asked aloud addressing no one. He's here to fix them, the voices reiterated, as if somehow meaning both to reassure and to frighten me at the same time. I wanted to run out of the store, but the front entrance through which I had entered was now only a blank wall. The only way out was through the back door in the corner where Richard was occupied with the animals. He seemed fairly engrossed in whatever horrible things he was doing, and I thought that if I could run fast enough I could make it past him and escape through the back. When I finally reached my destination, 
Fighting my way through the resistant atmosphere of the dream dime store, I found that the doors were locked. I tried to kick the doors open, but then I saw that their glass was reinforced by crisscrossing veins of metal wire. Before I woke up screaming, Richard turned his head to look my way and then reached out to grab me. But his hands were in hands. They were great white gloves. But these gloves didn't have the requisite number of fingers on them. I had seen them before, and not just in dreams. Because nothing in dreams is original, it's all plagiarized from waking life. And the gloves in the dream were merely a frightening reflection of something I had come upon earlier that Saturday afternoon. There was a derelict warehouse that was located just outside the downtown area. For some time I had intended to make an excursion there in order to look around inside and take some photographs before the city had the place sealed up. I was not in any sense an expert photographer, and my equipment was not in the least sophisticated or expensive. I took my pictures in color, not the black and white of a serious photographic artist, and brought my film to a local drugstore for processing. While I certainly desired to retain a record of the sites I had visited around the city over the years, my picture-taking was something of an excuse to justify and explain both to myself and to anyone else who might wonder, my presence in the city's many regions that had passed from squalor to abandonment, from abandonment to decay, and from decay into the ultimate stages of degeneration that bordered upon complete disappearance from this world. It was not the wabi of battered but still useful objects that I was seeking, it was the sabi of things utterly dejected and destitute alone and forgotten, whatever was submitting to its essential impermanence, its transitory nature, whatever was teetering on the brink of non-existence that was the fate of everything that had ever been and awaited everything that would ever be, every person, every place, every purpose, and every plan that could possibly be conceived. This, in a nutshell, was what brought me to explore and to photographically document the exterior shell and the interior spaces of a derelict warehouse that Saturday afternoon. This place was not unlike many others to which I had made similar excursions. From outside one couldn't say for sure what purpose the structure, which occupied almost half a city block, not including the field of weeds and broken concrete adjacent to the building, had once served. The words painted across its side had been reduced by time and the elements to a few fragmented letters which themselves had all but found their way to the other side of invisibility but I had already gained enough experience in these matters to be able to distinguish a derelict factory from a derelict warehouse. And once inside, entering through a doorway without a door, I found that I was correct in my judgment. I should say that it was not my customary practice as an aficionado of modern ruins to invade their interiors. There were several good reasons for this. One. There were physical risks when one disturbed the sensitive spaces of deteriorating structures. Every footstep had the potential of setting off a chain reaction of collapsing walls, stairways, overhead fixtures, and the like. 2. These places frequently served as home ground for various persons who had nowhere else to call home, the cast-offs and losers of a world that had no use for them and did everything it could to push them further and further into exile, because the presence of these living ghosts, these ambulatory spirits, was simply too haunting to be tolerated, provoking a dismal reminder of something that must be ignored at all costs. For these specters were not merely human detritus that the rest of us had left behind, but also citizens of a future that awaited all the empires infesting this earth, not to mention the imminent fall of those fragile homelands of flesh which we each inhabit. And even though I had already taken several psychological steps into their desperate world, I felt too much fear of these precocious residents of oblivion to advance any further. 3. 
the sad and tranquil pleasures of Sabi that lured me to these old piles were best enjoyed at a distance, in suggestive long-shot views of desolate scenes rather than too clear close-ups of some hopeless drunk or drug addict urinating against a wall. Yet there are some structures that draw you into them, inviting you inside to wallow in their degraded wonders. From the first time I visited the site of this derelict warehouse, which I had already photographed from the outside, I knew that this was one of those places, if only because its exterior offered so little in the way of outward suggestiveness. A nameless shell whose history and hopes were held back from the outside observer. It all seemed so enticing, but like every other attraction along the world's midway, the greatest part of its appeal lay in those moments of anticipation. And after it was all over, the particular attraction which had once promised so much would send you on your way unrewarded, purged of your curiosity and the poorer for being so. This derelict warehouse was, of course, no different. At least there were no squatters inside that I was called upon to deal with, or none that I saw, and the structure was still fairly safe and solid, with steel stairways that hadn't come loose from their walls, allowing me to make a quick reconnaissance of the place from bottom to top. Aside from the usual array of refuse and junkyard leavings, liquor bottles, worn-out tires, parts of machines, parts of appliances, parts of parts. I did find a filing cabinet in a room on the upper floor of the warehouse. Within that cabinet's drawers there were a few pages from a receipt pad that bore the ink-stamped imprint of Murphy's Costumes and Theatrical Supplies, a business that evidently stored some of its eponymous inventory in the warehouse. After further investigation I found some items lying in the dirt and darkness of a shattered wall. These were, one, a couple of mannequin hands, both lefties, and two, a very dirty pair of oversized gloves, each with a set of four sausage-shaped fingers, the accurate but strangely impractical accoutrements for the outfitting of both amateurs and professionals called upon to impersonate a beloved and begloved cartoon star. How mysterious, how ridiculous that my dreaming brain would discard the dismembered mannequin hands, which I found intriguing enough to take back home with me, and decide to feature in my nightmare about Richard those unnaturally large gloves which I left behind as lesser mementos of that disappointing warehouse excursion. Walking back to my apartment, I passed through the many shadows cast by great hotels, movie theaters, department stores, and office towers, each of them once filled to capacity with dreams of a future that abandoned them all with an unforeseen haste, leaving behind only untended monuments in a cemetery that no one bothered to visit anymore, with the exception of the odd photographer of ruins. Twilight shone through the spaces between these structures and illuminated their soaring peaks with an amber light, the hue of setting suns and fading worlds. The particular night that followed would have one hour removed from it, as the time zone in which I lived had daylight savings forced upon it, which for me only meant that I would spend the rest of that spring, all of summer and five weeks of fall, trying to recover a lost hour of sleep. This scheme for saving daylight, for creating the illusion that we could manipulate the clockwork movements of our solar system, was once justified to me as being good for business. Before returning to my apartment, I stopped by the Metro Diner to put this matter before Lillian. Good for business? she repeated with the emphasis of a skeptic. That's news to this old gal. You see anyone else besides you sitting at my counter? Lillian commonly referred to the diner as a whole with the synecdoche of her counter. You think another hour of sunshine's going to make any difference to me? Maybe it does to other folks, I don't know. As Lillian was talking to me, she was staring at the two mannequin hands that I had set down on the stool next to me. 
She reached under the counter and produced one of the brown bags that the diner used to package carry-out orders. Would you do me the favor of putting those nasty things where I can't see them? She said, handing me the bag. Sorry, Lil, I said as I stuffed the plaster hands inside the bag and crumpled it closed but I wasn't sure if my apology was for thoughtlessly bringing these unclean objects into Lillian's otherwise well-scrubbed place of business, or if the sight of these replicant parts of the human body somehow unsettled her. I suspected it was the latter, but I didn't pursue the issue. You still taking pictures of those old buildings and junk for your book? Lillian asked. Mm-hmm, I wordlessly replied turning away to look out the front window of the diner. I found it difficult, almost painful, to perpetuate the lie of my book to Lillian. But what could I say to her? That I'm drawn to those old buildings and junk because, voice beginning to seethe, because they take me into a world, the seething bills, a world that is the exact opposite of the one, voice seething to a pitch, the one I'm doomed by my own weakness and fear to live in, uncontrollable metamaniacal seething, to live in during my weeks, my months, my years and years of work, work, work. I don't understand it, she said. There's so many pretty things you could be taking pictures of. Far as that goes, I still don't know why you live upstairs. Not saying I ain't glad to have a regular paying tenant, but even I live in a better neighborhood, and you could live anywhere you want. What can I say, Lil? I am addicted to your cooking. Speaking of which, could I get the meatloaf special before you close for the day? Sure can, Lillian replied as she lit up a cigarette. You hear that, Rudy? Yeah, I heard, the voice of Rudy called out. As she poured out two cups of coffee, decaf for me, as she already knew. I wondered if Lillian's employees feared her in the way that I feared Richard. After all, one business is essentially the same as another, and she was the owner, CEO, and sole stockholder of that long-standing enterprise called the Metro Diner. I judged her to be easily as tough as Richard, and, in her own world, just as savvy. Was I now trading pleasantries with an elderly black woman who beneath the surface was no different from Richard the Bastard, Richard the Evil One? I liked Lillian, but I knew her only from the perspective of the customer, which made me just a little current in that river of cash that she needed to keep flowing into her accounts. You going to just stare at that coffee? Lillian asked. I smiled at being caught in an unguarded state of preoccupation with my dark thoughts. Then I took a sip of the decaf. It's good. Tastes like the real thing, I said, and this time I was telling the truth. Nothing hard about making a good cup of coffee, Lillian said to this customer as she lit up another cigarette. And that statement provided something of an answer to my questions about Lillian and her business because the coffee at the Metro Diner didn't have to be as good as it was, nor did the excellent food served there have to be so carefully prepared or so reasonably priced. That was not how we did things where I happened to work. The company that employed me strived only to serve up the cheapest fare that its customers would tolerate, churn it out as fast as possible, and charge as much as they could get away with. If it were possible to do so, the company would sell what all businesses of its kind dream about selling, creating that which all our efforts were tacitly supposed to achieve, the ultimate product, nothing. And for this product they would command the ultimate price, everything. This market strategy would then go on until one day, among the worldwide ruins of derelict factories and warehouses and office buildings, there stood only a single shining windowless structure with no entrance and no exit. Inside would be, will be, only a dense network of computers calculating profits. Outside will be tribes of savage vagrants with no comprehension of the nature or purpose of the shining, windowless structure. Perhaps they will worship it as a god. Perhaps they will try to destroy it, 
their primitive armory proving wholly ineffectual against the smooth and impervious walls of the structure, upon which not even a scratch can be inflicted. I spent most of my days in a world devoted to turning this fable into a reality. I knew that. I also knew that the Metro Diner did not exist in that world, that somehow it was located in another place altogether, a zone where the daylight really had been saved, even if it was fast running out. That was why I liked Lillian. That was why I lived in the apartment above her diner. And that, alas, was why I began dreaming about the doctor who reached with his puffy, four-fingered gloves into the cages and tanks of animals, of living merchandise, in a dime-store pet shop. Monday morning I awoke before dawn, shaking from the effects of another of these dreams. He has special gloves for fixing them, I mumbled with dream horror. He can go inside with his gloves. Even then he was already inside me, just as he had been inside so many others before, fixing them, fixing and fixing, fixing until, in one way or another, they broke. 7. All right, then. But I didn't have the opportunity to hear Richard speak these words that Monday. When I entered the room where I and the seven gathered according to a weekly schedule, where we sat in the dried-up leather of enormous chairs at a scarred-up banquet table, our little voices droning amid great dim spaces decorated in a Victorian Gothic style, I saw that the meeting was already in progress. Look who's decided to join us, Richard bellowed as I closed the heavy and intricately carved door of the room behind me. Glad you could make it, Mr. Domino. I glanced at my watch, which I had had the habit of obsessively monitoring for as long as I could remember. I had not arrived late to the meeting. I didn't know the time of the meeting had been pushed back, I said as I took my seat, everyone else staring at me in silence. Is it pushed back or moved forward? Richard asked rhetorically and disingenuously. I can never keep those straight. It's pushed back, I'm pretty sure said Sherry, giving the answer to a question that she didn't realize needed none. Well, in plain English, the time of the meeting was changed, said Richard, shifting back to his usual voice of bland authority. You should read your messages, Domino. I did. There was no message about— Actually, Richard, interrupted Carrie, I didn't want to risk someone not showing up on time because they didn't read their messages promptly, so I went around and personally told everyone, including Frank. It made sense that Carrie, the framer of innocent persons for stealing our lousy stamps, would have the job of ensuring that I arrived late to the meeting. There was no point in contradicting her. She could lie far better than I could tell the truth. But that wasn't what worried me at the moment. The greater issue was that the Seven had held a secret meeting before the real meeting, and I would never know what was on that other meeting's agenda. Well, never mind that now, said Richard, as though he were giving me a reprieve. We've wasted enough time on this already. Let's just move on to the usual reports and rigmarole. I'll bring Frank up to speed on the rest of it later. It was another full hour before the meeting ended. By that time everyone had drained to the dregs their two-liter-sized bottles of water, their waxy containers of fruit juice, and their volcano-shaped cups of coffee, tea, or who knows what. I could still feel the single cup of decaf I'd consumed with breakfast at the Metro Diner sloshing around inside me. Even Richard had upended his tall thermos of coffee, shaking it over his mug to get at those refractory few drops at the bottom. That was something I had never seen before, which led me to wonder how long the rest of them had been in conference before I arrived. Of course, no mention was made of my new product idea, my special plan. That whole matter had entered a realm of gamesmanship that now concerned only Richard and me, and had nothing at all to do with the company or with my original intentions to reaffirm my unity with the seven swine. 
After the meeting concluded, the other six supervisors gathered up their ringed scheduling books along with their cups, bottles, and waxy boxes, and filed out of the room in total silence, leaving me and Richard sitting some distance away from each other at that long banquet table. Richard was still shuffling some papers around and scribbling in his own scheduling book, or rather books, plural, while I waited anxiously for him to bring me up to speed. He reigned supreme when it came to the art of the torturous stall, creating the sense of a waiting period that might just trail off into eternity. Then, suddenly, he arranged his papers in a neat stack, slammed both of his notebooks closed, and looked down the table at Domino, who was rolling his pencil back and forth in an attempt to appear calm and casual, even bored. But I botched it, because as soon as Richard was ready to talk, I brought that pencil rolling to an instant halt and jerked my neck around to face the man at the head of the table. This is how it is, Frank, he began. There's going to be a few changes, sort of a shifting around. Barry's going to be leaving our little group in order to head up a committee to come up with a proposal for the new restructuring of the company, which we all knew was coming. It's Barry's wish that you also serve on this committee. Quite a compliment, I would say, considering the source. Now this is only a temporary arrangement, but it's going to be a full-time job. You, Barry, and several others to be named later will need to fully draft your proposal by midsummer. This timetable comes straight from the crowd upstairs. They want to see the new restructuring in place by year's end. Can I ask the purpose of the new restructuring? You know, it's the same theme as the last restructuring. I mean, sweet Jesus, how many variations can there be on cheaper, faster, and that other thing? Richard was as skilled as ever in privately sharing his very genuine cynicism in order to create the false sense that he was really on your side. But if I were you, I wouldn't bring up questions like that in front of the others on the committee. Just follow Barry's lead. He knows what's what with these things. And what happens in the meantime, while Barry and I are serving full-time on this committee? Mary's going to take over the day-to-day -day supervision of Barry's department, in addition to her own. And Carrie will do the same thing with respect to your people. She knows quite a bit about that new software being tested in your department. It's only a temporary arrangement. I don't foresee any bumps along the way. Do you? None at all, I agreed, not bothering to bring up Carrie's militaristic style of management, her burgeoning psychosis, and her all-round demonic nature. For the next few months I served, under Barry, on the restructuring committee, trying to make sense of his concepts for a company-wide reorganization and wearily accepting the successive editions of what he called the Master Chart, which even in its earliest stages resembled a more densely wrought and diabolical version of Dante's Map of Hell. Barry handed out these revised charts to the rest of us almost on a daily basis. Each one contained some infinitesimal modification or addition to the one before it, until the pages outlining his brainchild of restructuralization were almost black with boxes filled with tiny letters that had arrows pointing upward, downward, and sideways to other boxes filled with tiny letters. I never read any of the words, at least I assumed they were words, formed by those tiny letters, which grew tinier and tinier as the boxes became increasingly more numerous and the arrows, the arrows, ultimately pointed in every direction. Finally the deadline arrived for the committee to turn over its proposal to the greater powers whose offices occupied the 20th, 21st floor of the pre-depression era building in which the company was located until the time would come for it to relocate to a suburban locale far from the taxes of the city's downtown area. Now I could return to my old job as a department supervisor, right? Wrong. Because under Kerry's management, two of my old staff had transferred to another division, two had left the company, and two had been fired. Wrong. Because Kerry had her staff, Kerry's special forces, she called them, doing all the work once done by both my staff and hers. Barry didn't return as the supervisor of his old department either, but that was the way things were supposed to work out. 
He would start working on phase two of the company-wide restructuring while his staff was integrated with Kerry's special forces. Two understaffed departments were now doing the work of three that had been fully staffed. If I had only paid closer attention to Barry's charts, I might have noticed that this merging of work cells was part of the company's restructuring. And wrong again, because I had been given a new role in the company's puppet show, and Richard was pulling the strings with the four surgically dexterous fingers of his great gloved hands. 8. By the end of the summer, I was sitting in one of Barry's tiny square boxes in a corner of the company far removed from where I had been just a few months before. My co-workers were now temporary help, college co-ops, and persons who possessed the ability to spend every workday with their eyes positioned 18 inches from a glaring, blank screen their fingertips in constant motion across their keyboards, a never-diminishing pile of pages stacked on the desk counter beside them. On the rare occasions that I ran into one of the seven, perhaps in a lavatory, perhaps in a hallway, they never failed to greet me with the sweetest smiles and concerned inquiries into how I was doing. Just fine, I replied although my unsmiling face and dead voice gave me away to the victorious seven, who were on the side of righteousness, the rule of corporate law, and Richard. Speaking of home, I should record the fact that every so often I still received messages from him, asking about my new product idea and suggesting that perhaps the time was nigh for the company to make some riskier moves. Was he serious? I didn't know. Did he want to use the complete documentation of my idea, my special plan, to undermine my status in the company even further than he already had? Or was there some other reason altogether that he kept up communication with me on this subject? I didn't know. I didn't know. But I did know one thing. No good could come of giving Richard what he wanted from me. He would never ever see the full documentation of my idea, because it was now in a very safe place, and withholding what Richard wanted did give me some minuscule satisfaction that mitigated, however slightly, what I had endured at the hands of the Seven. So why did I stand for such treatment? Why didn't I leave the company? Why didn't I do any of a dozen things that I had contemplated doing for many years? At the time, there was only one answer to these questions. The doctor had gone inside me, and with his gloved hands he had fixed me and fixed me good. Did I mention that I suffered from obsessive-compulsive disorder? Even for a person of average emotional stability, the lust for revenge can be quite a time-consuming affair. For me, it was all-consuming. It shoved aside every other thought that got in its way, every fantasy and feeling that might have led me back to my former self, every memory of who or what I had ever been. My nights and weekends were now taken over by a set of constantly recycled scenarios in which Domino had his day, and that day was soaked in bathtubs of blood, a day of judgment overseen by a never-setting sun that burned madly red against a black sky. But I had always been weak, and as I think I might also have mentioned, I had always been afraid. So Domino would tough it out. Domino would hang in there. Domino would lay low until... until... until what? I had no idea. Until... One night I was preparing to leave work, putting away my ID badge, shutting down that staring square of the blank, etc., and, obsessive-compulsive that I am, I had gotten into the habit of placing a page from a legal pad on top of my pile of unentered data, a page on which I had written, Work Not Done, just in the unlikely event, just on the remotest chance that someone from the cleaning staff, or who knows who, might see the pile of data as the waste paper which, in fact, it could justly be mistaken for. No one else among my co-workers, it goes without saying, ever took such precautions. I, on the other hand, could not maintain that puny part of serenity that I still enjoyed without doing so. But when I arrived at my desk the next morning, my work not done note, along with the whole pile of unentered data it covered, was gone, nowhere to be found, disappeared. 
I reported the missing materials to my supervisor who, strangely enough, did not seem in the least concerned with its whereabouts. What really concerns me, Frank, said this boy who a year before had not even heard of the company in which he now held the post of supervisor, that is, my primary concern, is your overall performance, both in this department and in the company as a whole. You're the least productive employee in the department, for one thing, and I've been looking at your file from human resources. It's kind of ugly, if you want to know the truth. Forget that you've never really been a team player, at least according to the evaluations you've gotten from your former manager. There's also stuff here about theft from other employees, mismanaging your department when you were a supervisor, not carrying your weight when you served on the restructuring committee, sexual harassment, and overall lacks a, lack a, day, a bad attitude. It's your whole profile that's the problem. I've tried to cut you some slack around here because I know you've been with the company for a long time, but you're just dead weight these days. This so-called disappearance of your work, I don't know what to make of that. Someone's going to have to go to a lot of trouble to regenerate that data. I'm thinking that maybe that's what you wanted. After continuing in this vein for a while longer, my punk of a supervisor gave me the option of resigning from the company, which I did immediately. I didn't want to, I really didn't, but there was no other choice. I knew who was behind this business, and I didn't stand a chance against him. Before I cleaned out my desk, which was not a big deal since the only personal possessions I now kept at work were some packages of cookies, and before I turned in my letter of resignation, why letter, why not statement or declaration, I stopped by the men's room and simply stood before the large mirror, staring at the image of someone who was staring back at me. He was of average height and build, average weight, average age, with hair neither long nor short. He was clean-shaven. He wore corrective lenses with a slight amber tint. His eyes were brown. All right, then, he said to the image in the mirror. Then he turned and walked out of the room. 9. Cheap clothes stores, cheap electronics stores, Lico Lotto and checks cashed here stores, wig shops, pawn shops, gun shops, gun shops, gun shops. There was a particular gun shop that I had walked by every day on my route to and from my job. It was a small building and never appeared to be open for business. I had never been in a gun shop before, but I walked into this one as if I were a regular customer. Looking around, I felt the same excitement I'd known as a kid when I visited the local dime store to run my eyes over the colorful boxes of model cars, the battery-operated robots, the squirt guns, the cap guns, the cowboy guns, the tommy guns. What can I do for you? asked the bearded little man, almost a dwarf, who emerged from a back room. I must not have answered him, because he repeated his question. Then he said, Are you looking to buy a firearm? Yes, sir, I said emphatically. Indeed I am. Something for personal protection? asked the bearded little man. Actually, I said, I'm here for a dual purpose. Personal protection is in fact an issue. You see, the neighborhood where I live isn't as safe as it might be. I hear you, interjected the bearded man, who seemed to have lost about an inch in height since he first appeared. Yes, well, that's the first part of my mission. The second is that I'm here to do some early Christmas shopping. I have some friends, seven of them to be exact, and this year I'd like to present them with the gift, as you say, of personal protection. I've done the same myself. Really, I said, noticing that the gun shop dwarf had definitely shrunk another half inch or so. Now I have to admit that I'm not very familiar with all the varieties of handguns. You have quite a lot of them here. Best selection in the downtown area. That's terrific. Then show me what you've got. I'm very much open to suggestions. But the dwarf had disappeared entirely from sight. Then I saw that he had only been squatting down with his head inside the glass counter that stood between us. When he stood up, no bigger than before and perhaps even a bit more shrunken, he held out a handgun that looked absolutely gargantuan in his puny palm. Go ahead, hold it. I did. 
It's a Glock, he said. I've heard of these from television shows, I said, amazed at how wonderful it felt in my hand. I pointed it toward the wall and looked down the barrel. Tears almost came to my eyes. In the background of my elation, the dwarf spoke of the weapon's reliability, its accuracy, its magazine capacity. I'm sold. I'll take two of these, one for myself and one for my friend Barry. What else have you got? The dwarf began rushing around. He was now so close to the floor that I had to look over the counter to see him. He showed me Rugers, he showed me Mausers, he showed me Smiths, Brownings, and Berettas, and then he showed me a fire star. Compact, nice weight. You could carry it around in your jacket and not even know it was there. As a seven-round capacity. Seven, I repeated and in the next breath put it on my shopping list for sherry. It should fit perfectly into a woman's purse, wouldn't you say? I suppose, if the purse wasn't one of those tiny things. After seeing a few more makes and models of handguns on which I had to pass, feeling myself an expert at this stage, the dwarf brought forth a USP tactical. Forty-five automatic, five-inch barrel for superior accuracy, a real special forces weapon. Did you say special forces? I said. He did. Do you have a couple of them in stock? He did. A blessing on his dwarfish head. That left two more to complete my arsenal, and I knew just what I wanted. Their barrel lengths, it turned out, were only one inch and seven eighths. Uncle Mike's boot, they're called, said the dwarf. Fits right into an ankle holster, just like you said you wanted. And do you have such holsters readily available? I asked. I can get them by the time the legal paperwork goes through on this merchandise. Do the holsters come in black? I asked. I can check. Do you want holsters for the rest? Yes, I do. And make sure there's one left side holster for my lefty friend Perry. The truth was that, among my other unusual traits, I was ambidextrous, and the cinematic image of a vengeful figure pulling out pistols with both hands at once suddenly flickered brightly in my brain. Holsters are important for safety reasons, squeaked a voice from the shadows of the floor. I've also got the kind that clip onto your belt. That's exactly what I was thinking. I said as I laid my credit card down on the counter and began filling out the registration forms. By the way, is there possibly a place in the nearby area where I could get some instruction in the proper use of firearms? It so happened there was. So my schedule was set. I could pick up the guns on Friday and then spend some time working on my weapons technique. By Monday morning, I would be ready. As I was filling out the last of the registration forms, I happened to glance at another section of the counter where a shining array of outdoor knives was laid out. One in particular caught my eye. Thirteen-inch buckskin or hunting knife, the dwarf informed me. That is excellent, I gasped, trying my hardest not to weep with gratitude at the magnificence of this implement. Farewell to the humble charms of Wabi, the morose pleasures of Sabi. Greetings to the potent joy of cold-forged steel, to the harsh intoxications of temperature-resistant polymer components, and a special hello to pure ballistic stopping power. Your credit card is really taking a pounding today, said the bearded little man, who had returned to his previous height. Oh, that's all right. I said, picking up my bag containing my leather-sheathed buckskinner hunting knife. I had already made my last payment to those bloodsuckers who had issued me that particular piece of plastic, I thought as I stepped out of the gun shop and into the sunshine of a brilliant October afternoon. But I had a busy day ahead, and no time to waste. 10. I skipped lunch and went directly to the only halfway decent men's clothiers with a franchise still located downtown. 
There was a metal plaque flanking the entrance to the store, which told me that the clothes company had been founded the same year that young Mary Shelley published the first edition of her novel Frankenstein, 1818. What a glad coincidence that I happened to be looking for an outfit in the Gothic style. I purchased one light and loose-fitting raincoat, color black, one mock turtleneck that was made mostly of Italian merino wool, color black, one pair of black denim pants that fit nicely over a pair of black leather boots and provided plenty of room to secrete those boot guns named for good old Uncle Mike. And those holsters better be black, I thought. I was wearing my new clothes when I walked out of the store, having abandoned my old ones in the dressing room. I asked to keep the box for the boots, since I would need it when I proceeded directly to my bank in order to empty my savings account. May I ask why you've decided to close your account with us? asked the gray-suited man to whom the teller had sent me. He was sitting behind a desk in a corner of the great vaulted lobby of the bank. Because I despise you, I replied, looking at him straight in the eye from behind amber-tinted eyeglasses. I beg your pardon? I think you heard me. This is a bank. I'd rather carry my money around in my crotch than have it serve the purposes of this institution for another minute. The banker, somewhat petulantly, retrieved three forms from the top drawer of his desk and asked me to fill them out. Two of the forms he kept. The third he told me to take to the teller who had sent me to him. This is a waiver. You understand that the bank can't be held responsible for cash withdrawals once you've taken possession of your funds. Even while you're still on the bank's premises, our security guards will not be available for your protection. As I rose to go back to the teller's window and have all my money loaded into the shoebox I had brought with me, the gray-suited man added, We sincerely have enjoyed serving you and hope to do so again in the future. It occurred to me that all civilization was structured so that such people could make snide remarks like that and get away with it. They had been getting away with it for thousands of years and would continue to get away with it until the end of time. After cashing out at the bank, I took the shoebox back to my apartment and wrapped it securely with packing tape. Then, with a felt-tip pen, I wrote across the top, For Lillian Hayes, thank you. I signed my name underneath these words, along with the day's date. Then I placed the box on my desk between my computing machine and printer. Yes, I did own such a machine, despite the maledictions I routinely heaped upon them. I told Richard I had worked on my new product idea at home, and that was the truth. I only lied about having any part of it in handwritten form. No, I wasn't going to take an axe or a baseball bat to it. Yes, I did plan to take an axe or baseball bat to it when the time came. But until then, I still had use for it. Before I did what I was going to do, I needed to make a statement, because I had no intention of being around for questioning when the smoke cleared, and there were definite issues that needed to be addressed. First, the question of insanity. This would certainly be a discourse that would eat up quite a few pages. However ludicrous it now sounds to me, at the time I was quite concerned that in the aftermath of things I would not be dismissed as just another kook a loner who took pictures of ruined places in his spare time, a burned-out weirdo, a guy who couldn't take the pressure and who finally snapped like so many others before him, even worse, to be perceived as a psychological casualty of the times, as if there were something special about any period, any place in which a particular body chanced to find itself in motion. I must have been crazy to have thought I could talk my way out of that one, Second, the issue of evil. For many years, as I ran my mind's eye over the tiny print of the innumerable pages of history, or contemplated some great, or not so great, atrocity reported by the nightly news, I always said to myself, better to be the one who is executed than the one who performs the execution. I knew that I would have to come up with some fancy reasoning to maneuver myself from that position of armchair rectitude to a pile of bullet-shredded bodies, even if the last one on the heap was my own. 
Many, many words would have to be processed and many pages printed out to explicate such a dramatic moral turnaround. Or so it seemed to me as I walked the floor of my apartment, tapping out a rhythm on my black denim-clad leg with the blade of my buckskinner hunting knife. Third, and last, the problem of polemics. There was no way in the world that I wanted to be caught in a state of naked self-justification for what would undoubtedly be seen as an act of egregious overkill. After all, what crimes had been committed by the seven to deserve such a judgment, and who was I to carry out that judgment with such severity and with such style? Well, like it or not, there are no rules in these matters, only impulses, the exercise of power, and a convenient time and place, motive, means, and opportunity in the squinty eyes of the law. Question. Were there no other options that might have been less violently explored? Answer. None that presented themselves to my obsessive-compulsive brain. Question. Couldn't I have sought professional aid to control my mania? Answer. I had already swallowed a candy store of medications without appreciable results, except a constant cramp in my gut, and I had undergone a kaleidoscope of therapies which were not any more effective than the meds, although at least they didn't affect my digestive system. Question. Reprise. Wasn't there some other course of action I might have pursued? Answer. If there had been, I would have. Since I didn't, there wasn't. So those were the matters that occupied my mind, along with a lot of other nonsense, as I made my final outing of the day to an office supply store. I would certainly need to buy plenty of paper and some extra cartridges of toner in order to bring forth an adequate declaration, an ultimate statement, of all the facts. My letter of resignation from the human race. At the checkout counter my credit card finally breathed its last, and when I left the store I tossed it in the nearest trash container. Then it occurred to me that I wouldn't be needing any of the other documents I had collected in my wallet over the years, and so I tossed all of that junk away too, along with the wallet itself, that battered old pal of my back pocket. Freed of these encumbrances of official identity, I practically soared like a huge black crow through the October twilight back to my apartment. Nonetheless, my mind was still spinning about, fretting over the precise form and phrasing of my ultimate statement. It seemed to me that there remained some issue that I had yet to face, some vague but fundamental question I had not regarded, some abysmal matter that I still could not approach that possibly no human brain had ever approached. Of course, the simple answer to everything I was about to do was that I felt myself trapped in a maze of pain, and the only course of action that presented itself to my mortal faculties was to shoot my way out. I could always fall back on that as my closing line. However, all of this mental exercise came to a skidding halt when I realized that, due to my state of distraction, I had left my goods back at the office supply store, and it was almost closing time. Spinning around on the sidewalk, I began racing back toward my point of purchase. But something happened that kept me from ever reaching that destination. When it happened, I couldn't say. Where it happened, I couldn't say. What it was, that I could say. It was the loudest sound I had ever heard in my life.